very much. Well, thank you all for coming today. I'm, I, I know this is uh, just before a busy week coming up here in Easter week, and I appreciate the, taking the time from your schedules to uh, sit in today's conversation, talk about financing energy efficiency projects, what to know before you sign. Uh, would like to briefly talk about the objectives for the day. Uh, basically, I'm going to touch on the pros and the cons of eight different financing options that are usually used in conjunction with energy performance contracts and energy related services agreements. And I want to delve into how you can use these different financing structures to overcome common management and financial hurdles in both public and private sectors. Uh, we're going to talk touch on loans, which probably everybody knows as much as I do about loans, uh, capital leases, operating leases, tax exempt lease purchase agreements, power purchase agreements, energy performance contracts, energy service agreements, and PACE. In addition, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Inflation Reduction Act programs, uh, specifically about the IRA's 179D tax deductions, Section 48 investment tax credits, uh, 45L new energy efficient home tax credit, Section 5121 home energy efficiency rebate program. And I'm going to talk about three very specific energy star financing tools and resources. And the one that I'm most interested in is because I wrote a lot of the algorithms that are buried in it is the cost of delay EPA Energy Star's cash flow opportunity calculator, uh, which we have been working on and expanding to include uh, a variety of audience so that it touches everybody and everybody from an individual homeowner all the way to a uh, portfolio manager, somebody who owns a lot of commercial real estate, and of course, the public sector. But before I delve into that, first things first, uh, talk a little bit about what's going on in today's uh, economy. And uh, we continue to suffer a little bit from delayed installations, staffing shortages, supply chain. It's getting better, but we still have a little bit of a slowdown. Uh, there's increased costs that we're experiencing. Inflation is a, is a devil. Uh, it's increasing costs, both in products and labor. Uh, and uh, the lending community is looking at uh, higher interest rates. Why? Uh, they're applying tighter credit standards for new loans. Uh, if they, as the lenders look forward to what's happening, they're looking at potentially a deterioration in their portfolio of loans. And... Uh, so they need to protect themselves. And as such, they're normally looking for shorter terms on the loans uh, and lending activities that are coming in, which makes some of these energy efficiency projects or, or sources for energy projects more valuable because they tend to go longer term than you would find in the, in the, in the uh, financial community. Of course, there's an impact on energy savings with lagging utility rates requiring longer financing terms. Uh, and uh, of course, the IRA is providing new financing incentives that I will touch on momentarily. But before deciding on financing options, uh, it's, it requires some strategic planning and self ovations. Uh, we always recommend. The first step being and getting an energy assessment from a qualified service provider. Why is that? Uh, depending on the technologies that you're installing, uh, they tend to lend themselves to alternative financing structures and solutions. So knowing what you're installing will point you in a direction potentially of picking the right financing vehicle. Uh, you need to do some serious self-evaluation and define your short and long-term business goals. Do you own, do you lease? Uh, if you lease space, you know, entering into a financing agreement that's longer than the term of your lease could be a little difficult. Uh, uh, are you growing, are you or reorganizing or is your organization static? And uh, when you look at that, you know, you will be basically forecasting future cash needs. You also need to 
really understand your financial profile. So if you were to go to a traditional lender, how would they evaluate you? How would they score you? Uh, and do you have internal limitations on new debt or in conflicting covenants with existing debt or lenders? So that's a very important point because uh, if you do have these covenants, uh, that could really crimp uh, your ability to enter into a new funding relationship with new lenders. And of course, before you start looking at how to finance, I definitely recommend you go look at whatever incentives that are available to you through your local utility, local, state, and federal governments. And a good place to start there is the State Energy Office, NASIO, the National Association of State Energy Officials. They have a wonderful map, and I'm giving you the location uh, or the link to it here. Oh, by the way, everybody will be getting a copy of the slide presentation. So you don't need to take copious notes because you will be getting copies uh, with the links embedded. And of course, the Zero USA, the database of state incentives and renewables and efficiency, which is managed by the North Carolina State University. That's a great resource. They touch on everything from local utilities up, up through and including federal uh, alternatives uh, incentives for doing energy efficiency. But before you start looking for financing, as I had mentioned before, you really need to understand the benefits and consequences of the different financing alternatives. Before I delve into that, I want to give you a brief overview of the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, and especially as it, how it impacts uh, people uh, doing energy efficient renewable energy projects. There's some key takeaways from the IRA. Uh, you probably all know that it's uh, 891 billion. Maybe you don't have the exact number, but you know it's a lot of money. Total spending, 783 billion for energy and climate change. The three really big takeaways with the IRA, in my opinion, is that they've introduced a direct pay option for tax exempt organizations. They have the ability to transfer tax credits and monetize these tax credits. And of course, there are new tax credits for different and technology that was not available before. Uh, I mean, the really major, major impact here is direct pay for tax exempt. Before, if you had an investment tax credit, if you were tax exempt, you didn't pay taxes, therefore you didn't, couldn't take advantage of it, you can now. And tax credit and transfer monetization options basically means that if you couldn't use the tax credit because in the, you hadn't made enough money, tax credit means you offset tax payments. It's, it's, um, and if you don't have the app, if you don't have the, the uh, performance, uh, you can now sell that tax credit for cash and use that cash as uh, to, to help promote your business. So the energy security section G is really what we're looking at. And these are the tax credits and deductions to, that are used to promote private sector investments in clean energy technologies and to reduce CO2 emission, uh, emissions. Uh, the changes in the federal tax code really help the US real estate sector to reduce its carbon footprint. So it's a deduction to help make commercial multifamilies more energy efficient. That's section 179D. I'll get into that in a minute. Tax credit, which is quite different than a deduction, uh, is to encourage investments in renewable energy generation, storage, and other clean energy. That's section 48. Tax credit to incentivize the installation of uh, EV charging stations, section 30C. And a tax credit to incentivize energy efficiency, new residential construction, 45L. Last but not least, homeowners managing energy savings homes rebate program, and I will touch on that as well. So let's start with the 179 deduction. Uh, it expands the 179 deductions deductions to include architects, engineers, design bill contractors, and other designers of tax exempt buildings, both governmental and nonprofit uh, qualify here. Uh, building owners for both commercial and multifamily and REITs, residential building owners, four stories or more, building with four stories or more. Uh, 
this is interesting, especially for the REITs who were not able to take advantage of these deductions in the past to the structured uh, legal structure of the REIT, but that is no longer the case. Uh, the benefit starts at about 50, at 50 cents per square foot for energy savings of 25% reductions, and it goes up to a dollar per square foot for 50% savings on uh, energy uh, performance on a sliding scale. Uh, the 5X bonus has a requirement, and this can be a little demanding uh, in order to get that benefit, that the project has been done using prevailing wage and apprentice requirements. Uh, and the qualifications for retrofits has been reduced. Uh, the, the decrease in energy use intensity, EUI, uh, went down from 50% to 25%. That's the good news. Uh, and the requirement for energy simulation models was re removed. This is for retrofits only. Uh, if you have new construction, you still have to use a model. But uh, an insertion here and the, and the new interpretation is that the Energy Star Portfolio Manager, which has always been a wonderful tool, and I hope that everybody on the call is familiar with that tool, now plays a bigger role in being able to capture some of these Oh, tax deductions and tax credits. Briefly, uh, the Section 48 Investment Tax Credit, ITC, again, a tax credit is used to offset tax payment obligations. It's not a deduction. It's an offset for ta taxes that you owe. Uh, it is now 6% of the cost of the energy property. That's the base rate. And you can scale it up to 30% uh, of the cost with, referred to as a bonus rate if the project pays prevailing wage. Uh, Microturbines limited to 2% base rate and you know the multiplier times five brings it up to 10% as part of their bonus rate. As I had mentioned earlier, the credit transfers is now allowed to third parties. So companies with little or no tax liability, they could not in the past take advantage of these tax credits, now have the option to transfer these credits to other tax paying entities who can use them. And there's actually a, uh, a, a brokerage market that's being created right now to trade these tax credits. Uh, the investment tax credit may be refundable for tax exempt entities. That's wonderful news for uh, local governments, state governments, municipalities, schools, universities, any tax exempt organization can now monetize their investment tax credit. In the past, they couldn't, and they had to look for a financial structure that reflected a non-ownership of the equipment so that the owner, which would have typically have been a for-profit organization, could capture and take advantage of it and reflect the uh, investment tax credit and lower rates to the borrower. Alternative energy credits, section 48, once again, we've got our 5X bonus credit. Uh, the project must meet prevailing wage and apprentice requirements or be less than one megawatt if we're looking at solar or start construction before 129.23, which we can no longer do unless your project has already been uh, up and running. It must have domestic content of 40% of the total cost of steel, iron, or or, or a manufactured product that is a component of an energy project that must be produced in the United States. Uh, you have to be careful here because I have some of the information I'm reading now. Some of the uh, credits have been uh, re uh, cannot be complied with because an investigation into this the, the content of some of the materials, especially in so and a wind, uh, have this allowed the ability to capture their credit. So you have to drill down on what's the content of the equipment is and where it's made. Uh, energy community is another category. Projects that are located in a brownfield site or a statistical area, and I, you can read uh, as well as I can off the screen here, uh, and census tract. Uh, so these are areas that are economically uh, slightly disadvantaged, uh, they can uh, come into play now under the Section 48 alternative credit, uh, energy credits, and low income 
course, a lot of the uh, I IRA is focused on providing solutions and in low income areas and communities where typically becoming energy efficient has been a challenge. The 140, uh, the 45L new energy efficient home tax credit changes. So they've extended the rules to 2032, uh, 2023. The new homes certified under the Energy Star programs are eligible for a $2,500 tax credit for dwelling units certified under the Zero Energy Ready Homes program. The credit is increased to 5,000. And for multifamily units, the base qualification is decreased to $500. How uh, and with the uh, Zero Energy Ready Homes program, multifamily units go up to $1,000. However, that's a multiple that can be multiplied by the number of units that you have. Uh, the home energy efficient efficiency rebate program is $4.3 billion to the Department of Energy to award grants to state energy offices. And this is one of the reasons why I suggested in the very beginning that when you're looking at funding your projects, you start with your local state energy office because they know exactly what's going on, uh, what's up to date. Uh, these things are constantly changing. The Internal Revenue Service is coming out with, with new directions on how to process some of these grants and rebates. Uh, so, so you'll find the answers with your state energy office. So they also have uh, a home energy rebate program, which reduces the upfront cost to whole home energy efficiency upgrades, home electrification, appliance rebates programs, uh, and the rebates provided under homes rebate program may not be combined with any other federal grant or rebate. And you can capture this all the way up to and including through September of 2031. Green banks. Uh, mission-driven institution that use innovative financing to accelerate the transaction to clean energy and to fight climate change. Uh, that is directly from the Coalition of Green Capital. Uh, they are one of the primary movers in the creation of green banks. Uh, the purpose is to move, uh, use public capital to mobilize private investment. Uh, so they're creating structures uh, that would not normally be acceptable to the traditional lenders without the additional support from a green bank. Currently, there are 23 green banks in 17 states in D.C. and more under development. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act provides $27 billion in grants for the EPA Energy EPA to establish the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is established, divided into three little pockets, and about half of that uh, goes back through and is controlled again through your state energy office. So once again, we're back to contact your 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 NASIO office to find out more details as, as specific to your state. Uh, there is a national green bank network. And of course, they're looking at enabling low income and disadvantaged communities as part of the outreach program. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't at least touch on the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, even though it's not part of the IRA. But I'm just going to remind you if, if water is involved in your project, uh, this is a great place to look for funding, uh, municipal wastewater facilities, source pollution control, decentralized wastewater treatment systems, et cetera. You can see the list there, uh, but they, are wonderful with regards to providing funding for some of these projects, and they will allow some energy efficiency to be built into the program as well. So now let's take a quick look at financing all alternatives for the energy efficiency projects. And again, I'm really referring to structures rather than sources of funds. Uh, financing structure is one that can be utilized by a variety of funding sources but it's important to understand the difference between each one of these alternatives. It's a little map here uh, that lays the overall structure top down. Uh, if you see here internal funding on the right hand side of the 
chart here, internal funding uh, is not included here. Obviously, you don't need to finance. And I'm not talking about bonds. Bonds are uh, a very interesting alternative. However, it is so uh, specific, so much detail in it, that that would require a whole presentation unto itself. So I'm really looking at the more traditional and specialized types of energy efficiency financing. Under the traditional side, you know, I'm looking at leases, loans. Under leases, I'm going to talk about capital leases or type A and operating leases that used to be operating leases type B and tax exempt lease purchase agreements. If you're in the public sector, that's a wonderful tool. Now, in fact, a lot of the uh, energy efficiency improvements in the United States today are being funded using tax exempt lease purchase agreements in the public sector. Loans, consumer loans, commercial loans, uh, and equipment financing agreements. Well, we found that especially people in the leasing business, uh, because operating leases have become increasingly difficult to do, they've moved more into equipment financing agreements it's basically a conditional sales agreement in which uh, uh, you would essentially own the equipment at the end of the term uh, once you pay it off. So let's move over into specialized financing. Solar leases on the left side of this graph uh, within specialized. Uh, you see there's a little electric bolt there, and I'm using that to show that this is traditionally used for renewable energy projects, more so than energy efficiency, although you can bundle things into both. But uh, solar leases are highly structured uh, agreements and uh, you know there's no one size that fits all. Uh, so you need to kind of drill down. In terms of loans, they fall into uh, utility loans off OBF, on bill financing or OBR, uh, and bill recovery. They can be at below market rates. Usually they are, but not always. But the difference between OBF and OBR on bill financing is one in which the utility is permitted to use their own funding and recover any losses from their from the in their utility rate versus OBR. Um, you know, off, uh, uh, on bill uh, recovery, which is a third party, an agreement in which a third party is providing capital and it's being managed and serviced by the utility. And of course, there are specialty funders around uh, that can provide you with uh, interesting alternatives. You know, a National Energy Improvement Fund, for example, is one. PACE, I'm going to talk briefly about commercial PACE, residential PACE, and energy services, energy performance contract, traditional ESA, energy as a service, and power purchase agreements. So let's start with cash. I'm spending no time on cash because we all know that that's the easiest and fastest way of installing something. You write a check. Unfortunately, once you write the check, you can't use the money for any other income producing projects. So uh, that's the downside. And with all, most of these structures, maintenance and project management risk does fall uh, to the owner of the project or the host of the project. Uh, which can be contracted out to third parties. So I'm only going to mention that once, but you'll see there's mention to it in the bullets as we move forward. Everybody on the phone, I suspect at one time or another, has taken out a loan. I'm not going to drill down too much on that. Uh, it is potentially the lowest borrowing cost, short of paying cash. If you're going to a bank to set bank, you get a loan, Quite often, they require a blanket lien on the assets of your organization or the borrower. Uh, so that is a reason why the risk to the bar to the lender is a little reduced because they do have this blanket lien on, on other assets. Uh, some of the cons competes against other capital projects as before. If you spend your credit lines uh, on this, then you don't have your credit line available for other alternative projects, which may be more sexy than energy or uh, may generate more income. Uh, as I had mentioned and alluded to earlier, restrictive covenants uh, are often part of a bank loan where they tell you you have to provide perform, uh, perf your, your perf 
on financial statements that are to get register to judge your performance to make sure that uh, your credit standing hasn't changed. So they're going to be looking at you know key ratios, you know liquidity, uh, debt to equity, etc. Uh, if it skips, they can call on the loan, which can create some serious cash flow problems for organizations. They usually require a large down payment, not always, but usually. And of course, internal politics can't get away from that, no matter which solution or option you go for. We want to make a quick mention about off balance sheet financing. Uh, used to be a driver, certainly in the leasing business for operating leases. And basically, off balance sheet means that it's a company does not include the liability on its balance sheet. Uh, and it's an accounting term and impacts a company's level of debt and liability. Uh, by avoiding additional debt, you can improve your financial ratios, profitability, return on investment, liquidity, leverage, uh, efficiency, etc. Uh, it also allows you to lower borrowing costs because you don't look like uh, you're so leveraged. And that may allow you to avoid breaking le lender covenants. Um, once again, lender covenants come into play here. However, 2018, and we can thank Enron, if any of you on the phone are, are old enough to remember the Enron fiasco, uh, the Enron disaster created a situation in which the Financial Accounting Standards Board, FANS FASB, which is located in Stanford, Connecticut, they changed the rules and they created special asset categories of right to use and a liability, which is the net present value of the payments that now go on to the balance sheet. So uh, basically operating leases are no longer the operating lease of old, but there are alternative structures if off balance sheet financing is important to your client or you. That's a question that you need to bounce off of your financial people, your CFO, or, uh, to see if in fact that is a consideration or a concern. So the old type A lease, the old capital lease still available. It allows you to capture new credit lines. One of the big benefits in leasing is it allows you to structure a lease so that you can uh, create steps or skips when you're making your repayments. I'll give you an example. Uh, we did some financing for uh, Con Ed, uh, or, uh, no, I'm sorry, not Con Ed, for, well, it's in New York, in New York for a New York, um, amusement park and the park was closed in the winter and open in the summer. So we created a plan for the utility on behalf of the utility to uh, have the payments reflect the cash flow of the, uh, the uh, amusement park. So in the summer when they were cash rich, bigger payments. In the winter when they had no cash flow or limited, small payments just to keep in touch to make sure that you know, our clients still leave alive and breathing. It does provide 100% financing, often not like banks, which does re may, may require a large down payment. And uh, of course, depreciation interest is tax deductible. It is secured by the asset being financed, unlike a bank loan where you may be dealing with a blanket lien. Uh, at the end of the lease term, the lessee owns the asset and any investment tax credits automatically go to the lessee or the building owner. Once again, the cons, because the secured the asset the loan is secured only by the asset financing, financing costs may be slightly higher than a loan. Again, blanket lien reduces exposure and risk to the lender, and the, therefore you get slightly lower rate. Uh, the owner again, project management responsibility, maintenance cost responsibility, and those are pretty standard. <laughs> Uh, the old operating lease is now called a type B lease. And there's an alternative to that, which is called a tax lease. Uh, now we're getting splitting into hairs here. It's the difference between a, an operating lease, which goes into the financial balance sheet and has to be reflected versus a tax lease, which could appear on the balance sheet, but 
could be deducted for tax purposes. So there is a distinction between the two. If you're dealing with a good leasing company or somebody who really understands leasing, they can help you walk through which is the best alternative for your particular organization. Uh, it gives you access to new credit lines. The structuring flexibility continues there. Um, I, I, I didn't talk about step lease. Step leases, as you're installing the equipment, as the equipment get installed, your payment can go up as the energy efficiency uh, savings are accruing. So you can tie the payment directly into the savings that are being realized on the particular project. 100% financing, uh, lease payments uh, may be tax deductible. And uh, the cons are, uh, it's no longer off balance sheet, as I've mentioned before. Uh, it used to be that the investment tax credit could not be used by the less by the lessee. However, that has changed with the Inflation Reduction Act. So that's why I left it here and just crossed it out. That's a really big change. Uh, the owner is responsible for project management, etc. Uh, just a little quick note, oh, and, and just to reinforce that. If the tax lease is properly structured, it can be expensed, but only for IRS purposes, only for taxes. And solar leases usually fall into this category of, of an operating type lease. Brief word about taxable versus tax exempt financing, tax exempt leases. When we talk about tax exempt, I'm really talking about a lease financing that has and offers the borrower who has to be in the public sector a lower interest rate. Why is that? Because the lender doesn't have to pay federal income tax on the interest earned. Who can qualify? Public sector has on the Internal Revenue Service has determined that public sector organizations that have eminent domain, taxing powers, police powers will qualify. However, private sector and large nonprofits can qualify if they go through a conduit agency to issue tax exempt financing. Conduit agency, for example, could be uh, uh, the uh, DAS, DASNY, which is the um, tax exempt agency in New York State. It's a dormitory authority. Uh, for example, if a private university, Cornell, for example, is a private university, can go through DASNY through the state of New York and access lower cost tax exempt rates. You do pay a small fee for it, but at the end of the day, the net cost of financing is lower than it would be if you went through the private sector and didn't have access to tax exempt rates. Again, big change, public sector doesn't pay taxes. That's still true. However, they can now use the tax incentives through the IRA redefinition. Tax exempt lease purchase is an installment purchase, conditional sale lease. It's also known as a municipal lease. It only can be issued by state or political subdivisions, cities, towns, schools, special purpose districts, and some not for profits. Uh, the rates are lower. Structuring flexibility continues to exist. I mean, I see this a lot when I'm dealing with a public sector organization with a large energy project that requires ins installation and steps. So you can structure the finance repayment so that the dollar repayment amount increases as the equipment gets installed. So the actual savings that are being generated, in fact, do pay for the energy efficiency financing. Uh, one of the big benefits here is it usually does not require a referendum for approval. So when a public sector or, or, organiz or organization goes in for issuing new debt, uh, they need to get the sign off uh, new, typically through a referendum from the voters. Uh, in this case, the tax exempt leases do not require that. Why? Because the payments may be subject to the annual appropriation of funds. What does this mean? Well, uh, if the funds are appropriated this year, uh, you pay down the lease payment. But if next year the organization does not approve the appropriation of funds, then the financing agreement is considered null and void. It's canceled. It's not a default. It's just a cancellation. What happens in the case of a, of a non-appropriation? Well, the borrower, in this case, a municipality or a school district has to return the equipment and the lender takes it back and they can no longer collect. And it is 
again, not so who would take on that kind of risk? Well, lenders do. That's pretty common, very popular structure. But one of the things they look for is essential use of the asset. Is the equipment of essential use? Obviously, if it is, the potential of not appropriating funds is substantially reduced. So if somebody wanted to do a tax exempt lease purchase agreement on a, a swimming pool cover at a school, that probably wouldn't work because it is not of essential use. However, if we're doing lighting in a school and heating and air conditioning, all of that definitely is in, uh, of essential use. And yes, you can add to it. You can add that pool cover to it as long as it's de minimis. It's not a big portion of the amount of the project. Interestingly enough, the true interest cost referred to in our business as the tick is usually lower than issuing a bond for small and medium sized projects. Uh, and of course, the lessee owns the asset at, at the end of the lease term. Cons, politics can be very lengthy. It used to be that you couldn't take or sell the investment tax credit, uh, which you can now do. And of course, maintenance and project risk continue. Let's talk briefly about energy service performance contracts. It's a service providing customers with a comprehensive set of energy efficiency, renewable energy, distributed generation measures, accompanied by or with guarantees that the savings produced by the project will be sufficient to finance the full cost of the project. Now, this implies you'll be working with an energy services company or an ESCO. Uh, they're typically turnkey services. They're very comprehensive measures. Uh, project financing is normally included. However, it is typically uh, separated and treated as a separate agreement. Why? Because if the energy service company, ESCO, were to fund this, they are they do not qualify uh, as a for tax exempt rates because they. Uh, they don't meet any of the three requirements that I'd mentioned earlier for the IRS. However, if these technology and the financing are split, uh, then the entity can directly deal with the lender and they will, in the public sector, qualify in all likelihood for tax exempt rates. Uh, in this case, you get project savings guarantee that's done through the energy service company who will uh, can help uh, by providing monitoring and verification to make sure that the savings continue to occur. Uh, careful review of the contracts, critical. And that's pretty much true with all of the energy service agreement type structures. Know what you're signing. Make sure you're not getting, you're not committing to a services that you don't really need or want. So what's an energy service agreement and how is that different? Well, the equipment is owned and operated by the energy efficiency company and not to host. Equipment financing costs are bundled into the fee for service. Obviously, that means that they would not get tax exempt rates. However, the pros are no upfront cost to the host. Project is managed and maintained by a third party. And really the big plus here is it may be considered off balance sheet, which is why I said earlier, speak to your financial people. How important is off balance sheet financing to your organization? If it is important, you're going to have to come back and look at some of these variations here, traditional ESA, where the equipment's owned by the ESCO or uh, the owner pays the utility bills, uh, energy as a service, which is an up and coming uh, variation of this, which has been around, by the way, for many, many years in Europe. Uh, we finally incorporated this uh, concept into the United States. Uh, but this includes equipment upgrades and replacements. I'll give you an example. And, and if it could be that uh, certainly in Europe, this was the way it was sold. Uh, I'm dealing with a, a grocery store and I want to guarantee that the refrigeration units stay at a constant uh, 38 degrees or 36 degrees. So that would be an energy as a service to guarantee that everything is working and maintained and everything is performing as it needs to. Uh, usually, the ESEAAS company, Energy as a Service Company, will suggest alternative energy sources and structures. So you're really kind of entering into a pseudo uh, partnership with the new company in order to help you and assist you gain the maximum benefit of your energy projects. 
Uh, there's a third one here, energy assets concession. So this is way less common. It's a very long term and it really requires very large projects in order to, to, to qualify. For example, a, a university could sell all of their energy assets to a third party who take over everything and they manage it, but it does require substantial uh, project costs, big numbers. CPACE. Financing mechanisms allows low-cost, long-term funding for energy water efficiency renewable energy projects. PACE financing is repaid as an assessment on the property's regular tax bill and is processed the same way as other local benefit assessments, it's like sidewalks and sewers and streetlights. So the pro, the pro is it's a voluntary program. Uh, if it's authorized in your state, uh, you can they can cover up to 100% of the project hard and soft costs financing terms can go out to 30 years which allows you to make very deep retrofits uh, can, can be combined with other incentive programs uh, and it may stay with the building upon side sale which means that if you enter into a pace contract basically what you're doing is you're putting the repayment responsibility and risk onto the, the real estate, which means it goes with the property, which means it goes to future owners. Uh, it's filed with the local municipalities, a lien on the property, and it may be considered off balance sheet, depending on how it gets structured. It does require state and local enabling. Uh, it may require first mortgagee approval. So if you do have a mortgage on the property, you may have to get your the bank that's holding your first mortgage uh, to give a waiver. And, you know, property assessments are normally paid once or twice a year, so you need to plan for that. Set aside a sinking fund so that you have the money uh, to pay when, when, when tax time comes. Uh, the loan amount is generally determined by the tax capacity of the property. That may be a little too technical for today's talk, but if that's something of interest, contact me. I can drill down on that. And interest rates may be higher than alternatives in exchange for the other benefits. 100% project cost, financing terms to 30 years, off balance sheet, and combined by uh, pushing it, pushing the, the payment obligation, keeping it tied to the property. So those are pretty big pluses. Where do you find your PACE programs? This was taken directly from PACE Nation. And uh, as you can see here, this is where active programs are available. Again, you get a copy of all of this these slides. Uh, power purchase agreements, legal contract between an electric generator or provider and a power purchaser or buyer, uh, typically includes both electric and hot water. Uh, and it's typically used for renewable energy projects. Uh, some of the pros again, minimal if any upfront costs, uh, potential to monetize tax incentives, which um, is not as important now under the IRA as it was before. Uh, typically a known long-term energy price, so you know what you're gonna be paying. Uh, it's got no or limited operations and maintenance responsibilities and have minimal risk for the, for the entity that's entering into it. Uh, cons, well, contract term limitations. You really need to read the contract uh, very carefully. Uh, the transaction costs are typically higher because whoever's gonna take on the project and own the assets going to have to have their engineers double check all of the numbers because ultimately they're responsible for repayment. That means the time to approve can be longer. Can't get away from the politics of approval. And uh, in this case, the investment tax credit usually goes to the owner of the uh, the owner of the of the contract. And again, we still have the same challenges with terms and conditions. Uh, it's common to find in these types of agreements, take or pay language, which means that if the savings do not realize, you may still have to make a minimum payment to the investor. So again, you need to read the contracts carefully. Uh, solar PPAs are very sophisticated and they're negotiated agreements. And they are basically PPAs. Now I'm going to go into it's an important note that the pros and cons are the most common ones. They're not intended to be all inclusive. Let's take a quick look at uh, hurdles blocking energy efficiency installations. 
How can energy efficiency financing structures assist you overcome some of these hurdles? That's the big question. Well, we divide the hurdles into two categories, operational and financial. If your operational hurdle is limited, limited staff, you know, or you have limited expertise, or if your organization finds it too risky, or you have other priorities, the economy is, uh, is we want to focus on income producing activity, or we feel that it's not our core business and we can't spend too much time figuring out what's the best thing for us to use, the stru best structure for us to use, uh, those are our operational hurdles. The financial hurdles, too expensive, we can get something cheaper, however the savings are less. Can't take on new debt. Once again, we're back with the bank covenants. You know, it's a little, a uh, little monster that head can pop up at any time. Our credit worthiness, you know, our financial performance is is not where it should be. The return is too low. You know, when you're dealing with corporations, you know, they're looking at quick returns. You have to have a two or three year payback or less. Uh, sometimes a matter of months. And a strong economy focuses on income producing projects. Uh, Capital budget constraints, you have to wait until funding is available next year, maybe or two years or three years, or the payback is too long. Uh, doesn't meet our return on investment thresholds, typically three to five years or shorter. So how do you use these hurdles to address, uh, financing hurdles to address these overcoming these hurdles? Well, here's a little chart. Again, uh, you don't need to Take notes here, you'll get copies of the slides. So if you have limited staff, you can see along the top here, cash loan, type A, capital lease, operating lease or tax lease, our purchase agreement, energy performance contract, or um, an energy services agreement or PACE. So if I have limited staff, you can see where we've got X's in the boxes. These are agreements that lend themselves more towards um, uh, you know, addressing that concern, that hurdle. Uh, financial, too expensive. Well, if it's too expensive, write a check for it. Uh, then, then you don't have to worry about financing costs, but you can go down the list here. Uh, can't take on new credit. Well, that's going to push you into the world of, uh, of off-balance sheet financing. So you've got four entities or four categories here that work. Credit worthiness, if you have a problem with credit, uh, that's a challenge, and uh, again, you got to start with uh, nonprofit funds, or uh, certainly take a hard look at Pace to see if if they can help you work your way through uh, to getting the project installed. If the return is too low, the financial return, PPAs, etc. Again, this is pretty self-explanatory. So let's take a quick look at Energy Star's financial tools. There are three. We we'll start with the financial value calculator, which uh, is designed for owners and, and, and quantifies the value of improvements of energy efficiency uh, to your organization. And it translates the savings that you realize in your earnings uh, into the market value of the asset, the property. So the more because properties are sold based on multiples of earnings. Uh, if we can improve the earnings, the cash flow of the building, in essence, what we're doing is we're increasing the value of the asset, in this case, the sales price of a building. Building upgrade value calculator. This evaluates the cost and benefits of energy investments for both owners and if tenants. Uh, it quantifies the expected changes and expense reimbursement under very common commercial lease structures. But the really, to me, the most important part of, or the be biggest benefit of this tool is it helps address split incentives, which is pretty common where you have one meter on a real on a commercial property and many lessees who are leasing out space, uh, but the owner of the property pays the utility bills but if they install energy efficiency benefit or equipment in the uh, properties of the lessees, then they realize the benefit. Uh, so this is a tool that addresses that and allows you to open up conversations, dialogues with, between landlords and tenants in order to make sure that everybody recognizes the benefit 
of the savings made from capital investments in the property. Um, and it's used in Boma Energy Efficiency Program, uh, Course 5. I mean, it's a, it's a good tool, and I think it's probably underutilized uh, when you're dealing with split incentives as a hurdle. And here's my favorite cash flow opportunity calculator. And that allows you to go toe to toe with your cash, your, your CFO. What do we mean by that? Well, it addresses we don't have the money. So if that's what you hear, we don't have the money. This is a great tool to take a look at. I'm going to take a sip of water here. Sorry. So it addresses that we don't have the money objection. It translates energy savings into financial speak. And it quantifies the cost of delay. Now, I think most people understand the concept of cost of delay, but this is a tool that allows you to actually quantify it. It answers three questions. How much new equipment can be purchased from the savings? Should it be financed now or should we wait and use money from a future budget and therefore not pay any interest? Or the third one, a little more esoteric, will we lose money by waiting for a lower interest rate? You know, and I have an example of that that I will share with you when we get to that point. Uh, it covers all market sectors, including public, the public sector, municipal, state, K-12s, higher ed, residential, CNI, water treatment facilities. It covers everybody. Uh, it helps calculate the cost of delay, which, as I said before, and it contains counterintuitive conclusions, potentially. One of them is by installing today and paying interest is a better financial decision than waiting for a future capital budget and avoid paying interest altogether. There is a chart that's going to be generated that will allow you to address that with the decision makers within your organization or within your client's organization. And the second one is lower interest rates are not always the best financial decision. That's also counterintuitive because the first thing that I hear people ask is what's the interest rate? Well, what the interest rate is, is an important question. However, but you need to ask uh, the next question, which is how long does it take you to get your hands on the lower interest rate? Because again, the cost of delay needs to be bundled into the decision when you're looking at this structure. The cost of delay, you know, we're paying for energy projects, whether or not we do the projects. Uh, and if we were all sitting in the same room today, I'd ask you to repeat that. What do I mean by that? Well, you can choose to do nothing, which means you continue to make payments to the electric and gas utilities for wasted energy. Uh, and you know, they're not going to give you back. They're not going to rebate that money to you if you decide not to do the project. So the sooner you do the project, the better off you are. The more savings you will realize. So when you download the tool, and I'll give you the link to download it, this is the first screen of the cash flow opportunity calculator. So you can see on the bottom here, it has tabs. It's built on uh, an, Excel, an Excel platform, the introduction, instructions, so very detailed instructions how to use it, data entry tab, investment values, cash flow, interest rates, and a summary report. So without further ado, I'll jump right into the data entry tab. So you can see here, anything that's in yellow is a field can be overwritten. So you can put your own data information in. Uh, in this case, you now this is an organ and enter your organization. We're choosing the benchmarking results from EPA's portfolio manager as the example. And again, you can enter all the categories. Let me click ahead so I can fill in uh, more details here. So when I had mentioned earlier that this covers everybody, uh, you can choose the, the language that you want this tool to use. If you're working a lead project, click on the green building category, lead, EV, and O&M, water waste water treatments. You know, they don't measure things in savings per square foot. They're look, dealing with million gallons per day. If it's an energy efficiency project, <coughs> uh, building upgrades or tune-ups, manufacturing facilities, they all have their own language. So we have modified this tool to pick up the language that is appropriate for the presentation or the, the proposal that you're making to improve the energy performance in this facility. Uh, data entry tab, 
this translates savings into dollars. So we're moving kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hours and therms translating to dollars. And as you can see here in the example, you know, we're using the uh, EPA portfolio manager. The, so 75 or better in this case for XYZ commercial properties. Uh, you can see under square footage. And I wish I could see how to find a little arrow here, but uh, I'm looking at 75 and better 200,000 square feet. Uh, you can see the breakout of the 1 million square feet based on the performance within the portfolio manager. We look at the annual energy costs by area, cost per square foot. We estimate a savings by category. Obviously, if something is performing 75 or better, it's gonna be harder to save energy. If it's performing below 70, 25, the opportunities are substantial. You put in your own numbers there. What we're looking for is the total savings that are going to be realized by implementing the energy efficiency improvement. So in this example, we're looking at $425,000 total potential savings on a million, uh, a million five uh, utility bill. So what are we going to do with that 425, 425K? Well, we're going to leverage it. How do you leverage? Uh, one of the things that I had, I had failed to mention before is as, as we go through the tool here, you can see at the very top, we're taking the data that was on the prior tab and we're, sh we're showing it within uh, the next tab so you can see exactly where the data comes from. If we're going to leverage the 425, we have to come up with some additional information, starting with assuming an interest rate, assuming a term. How much of the savings do we want to use to pay for the energy improvements? Are there any additional rebates or, uh, that we can capture in this particular project? And once we enter that data, you click the calculate button on the right hand side and you come up with projected savings. In this case, if all of these numbers are accurate, without savings, we can install $2,845,000 worth of energy efficiency improvements. Pretty good. Uh, the savings used for energy savings, just a quick side story, we were dealing with the school district on the West Coast, had a five-year build-out program for energy efficiency. Um, and uh, in looking at this tool, they wound up changing their, their build-out model until that minute. Next tab, cash flow. Uh, the cash flow tab, once again, in the top, on top of the little red box here, you can see the numbers that we are carrying forward. But in order to determine the impact of cash flow financing versus uh, waiting for cash, we need to add additional information. Years postponed, project cost increased due to the postponement, estimated energy cost savings in, in year two and after year two. Uh, for schools, and we were asked to do this for the University of Pennsylvania uh, to include another category here where they could not install everything quickly in one year. They had to parcel it out. So if energy efficiency savings is necessary to pay for the project, it gives you the opportunity to modify that a little bit. So if, for example, you're dealing with a school, public school, you don't have access to the room, then uh, You know, you can make that modification. Let's take a look at option A, fast track financing versus option B, waiting for cash. The savings, we took that number off of the first tab that we did. It's 12 times, it's assuming equal monthly payments times 12. So this is your project cost financing. You compare that to the savings. Remember in this example, we can only capture 75% of the savings in year one. So we're going to come out of pocket a little bit in year one. And year two, year three, all the way through the end, we're going to go through one year beyond the financing term. And as you can see here, uh, the net impact, positive cash flow back to the organization. And let's compare that to option B, waiting for cash. Well, we didn't do anything in year one. Year two, we pay cash for the whole project. Cash flow, we come out of pocket a little bit. And how do we determine which is the best financial decision? 
Well, a common methodology in the financial community is taking the net present value of the savings. And that's what we do here. We took the net present value of option A, 688,000, net present value of deferring it and paying cash, 404,000. So fast track financing generates 70% more cash than waiting. This is counterintuitive to a lot of your financial folks. So this chart is extremely valuable when you're making presentations to decision makers. In this example, if I delete the project for one year, <laughs> it's equal to 10% of the project cost. If I delay it for two years, 24% of the project cost. In the school district that I had alluded to earlier, they had a five-year build-out. They totally changed the, the design. They brought in more installing companies to accelerate the installation of energy efficiency improvements because they save more money. Uh, the interest rate tab, again, this is, as I mentioned earlier, it's a little more esoteric, but very valuable. And we all know that if I get a lower interest rate, I'll save money than if I have to pay a higher interest rate. In this example, I'm going to compare 7%, 7% loan to a 4.5% loan. That's a big substantial difference, isn't it? So if somebody were to say, well, why are you not taking the 4.5%? Well, I may have to wait for time because the funding is not available for me for maybe a year or two. So let's translate that into firms that can deal with the cost of delay. So in this case, the difference between these two interest rates, how much more, how much is the benefit for the lower interest rate? Well, if I take that present, take the monthly payment at 7% and the monthly payment at 4.5%, and I take the net present value of the difference between those interest rates, and I discount it using the lower interest rate, it comes up to, in this case, $342,000. I'm gonna take that money and put it into a bucket which is the chart on the, on the right hand side. So that 342 goes into the bucket. And now our question is, and we did this on the very first page, what are you losing by not installing the energy efficiency? Well, that translated in this example to $35,000 a month. So now the question is, how many months can you wait before you're better off entering into a higher interest rate loan? In this case, it's 10 months. So if you can't get your, money until two years. And by the way, you can use this with a zero interest rate as well. <laughs> as an alternative, the, 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 the tool will still work. This will tell you how long you can wait before you should go ahead and enter into the other alternative funding uh, opportunity. And again, this is potentially counterintuitive because most people always say, oh, the lower interest rate is the best deal. Not always true. It generates reports. So if you don't change the numbers while you're going through the tool, it will generate a very nice report that you can attach to uh, your proposal that you're making to your decision makers. Now, where do you get this information? Well, you get it from the EPA Energy Start.gov website. Click on commercial buildings, as you can see here. Uh, drill down and look for resources by topic. From there, you go into F for financing. And you look at evaluating the economics of energy projects. Uh, click on that, and you'll find the cash flow opportunity calculator there. So you would download it. Don't use it online. Make sure you put it onto your laptop, your, your desktop. And uh, if this is a tool that you think is interesting, uh, if there is a cash flow opportunity calculator calculations and methodology piece that we wrote. So if you want to create your own tool, I would suggest that you download that. That uh, methodology calculation tool, which is referred to and uh, in, in the, <coughs> in the last slide. So you can see the structure exactly what we are thinking when we built this tool. So you can apply it to your own circumstances, your own situation. Our tool deals with annual savings. You may want to do it for monthly savings. Now, there's another document that we 
uh, I've prepared, which is download financial speak for facility managers. That gets more into detail with regards to uh, how the different structures can be used to offset and address some of the shortcomings that you may have to get to yes with your management for your approval. And again, uh, downloadable directly from EPA uh, APA's uh, website. There's a little note here to the attendees. Uh, if you have a project that you think is of interest, whether it be an interesting structure or types of equipment and or financial structure uh, that you're using to fund a project, please let us know. We're always looking for case studies to post to the EPA Energy Star website. So if you fall into that category, don't be shy. Just send me or Goudret, uh and, and, and reach out to us, and we'll be happy to follow up with you to see if we can get you listed on the EPA Energy Star website. It's a list of additional resources. Uh, I think one of the most important one is the one at the bottom here. And IRA updates can be found at the U.S. Department of Treasury's website. So if you click on U.S. Department of Treasury, that's a hot link. It'll take you there. Just search under the word energy, and they publish latest uh, IRA uh, interpretations of any of the funding trends, uh, funding requirements with as they relate to uh, the. ITC, excuse me, the um, IRA. Uh, 